Guys, welcome to the I Love Seville show. It's great to be with you. It's Wednesday across Charlottesville, Almaro County, Central Virginia, and the world. Thank you kindly for joining us. My name is Jerry Miller. Fantastic program lined up for you. Steve Harvey in the house. This gentleman running for Board of Supervisors in Almaro County, the Whitehall District. We will spotlight his platform, his campaign, some of his beliefs. He's a passionate guy. I'm excited to see that passion on the show. Richard Fox uh, on the program as well. This gentleman, guys, one of the co-owners of Rosalind Farm. He has brought some fantastic fresh vegetables that I'm excited to uh, parlay into our cuisine tonight and over the course of the week at home at Casa de Miller. Um, I ask that you give the show a like and a share on any of the seven channels that you are watching. Thank you, Ray Cadell, for doing that. Almoral County in the spotlight, that means Ray Cadell is watching very closely. Before we welcome the fellas to the set, let's thank some of uh, our clients that make this program possible. We're very excited and very proud to serve as their advertising agency of record. First, Interstate Pest and Service Company is one of our favorite clients. This business started in 1969 with the first generation, Mr. Wells. Mr. Wells was one man, a one-man business and a truck that was his personal truck. Went to one home, serviced it successfully in the morning, then would find the closest pay phone in 1969 and call his second customer and say, may I come to your home now. Today, this business Business, almost 100 employees, four generations, a Commonwealth-wide footprint with the headquarters right around the corner from Bono's Bagels on Harris. We will also thank the good doctor, another fine client of VMV Brands, Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. It's physical therapy, sports medicine, and chiropractic care. He's changing people's lives. Who's got the back? Your back. Dr. Wagner's got your back. Let's go to the studio cam, Harris Tolber. He's our director. Judah Wickhauer, one of the producers. Lauren Linsky, also producing the program. Um, well, welcome the fellas to the show. Here we have Steve Harvey. Hello, Steve. Thanks for having me on, Jerry. Um, a pleasure. Your second rodeo here on the I Love Seville show. You hit a home run the first time. This gentleman, Richard Fox of Rosalind Farms, thank you con kindly for watching us. Um, Rosalind Farm, um, I, I feel like a mecca right on the urban <laughs> ring in Almoral County. Um, why don't we welcome Steve first and ask him to put himself into perspective, his campaign into the perspective, and what has uh, changed over the first time on the program to this time on the program, Steve? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Uh, so I'm running for Albemarle County Board of Supervisors in the Whitehall District. That's the biggest district in Albemarle County. It's mostly rural, um, Earliesville, Whitehall, Crozet, all the way up to a piece of Rutgersville right before you get up into Greene County. Um, my wife and I built a house and are attempting to build a farm up there uh, just north of the airport. It's, you know, a gorgeous district and um, really working hard to try and represent the people there. Been knocking on a lot of doors, printing signs, uh, doing fundraisers um, on the radio with Rob and, J and Tom, uh, sorry, uh, Joe Thomas. Joe Thomas. <laughs> and um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's been very interesting, getting tons of support, a lot of donations, mostly, you know, smaller donations, but uh, it's feeling really good trying to bring some economic prosperity, some freedom back to the, to the, to the county and Whitehall in specific. Um, I'd like to change the way the county works to make it more friendly environment for farmers, new farmers in particular, but also the people that have been, you know, digging their property for the last 50 years and are now seeing new regulations and stuff pop up. Um, they're changing the way they tax people so that um, the original way they constituted a, a tax break for people um, that were farming um, is no longer effective by de devaluing, I was talking to Richard about this earlier, uh, devaluing the price of the land and upvaluing the price of the house on the land um, incommensurate with reality. Mm -hmm. So the house didn't get $100,000 more expensive. They just took $100,000 off the price of the land so that they would have to pay more taxes. And that defeats the whole purpose of them setting up that program to begin with. But there's a lot of things like that, uh, trying to fight the ever-growing state here in Albemarle County and just keep it, you know, it should be a well-oiled, smooth, small machine that accomplishes the original goals of safety and, um, you know, the roads and the schools. That's what it should be, and it's turning into a million pet projects and, you know, ever, ever escalating tax, tax growth, so. 
Um, let me ask this, and Harris, put the cans on over there for me and check that. Um, I'm going to throw this to you, Steve. Um, put the race in perspective. Um, Ann Malik, institution around the area. Um, I think you bring a fresh voice and perspective. I said that the first time. Um, I think you bring a voice that's focused on making the, the area better long term. Um, compare and contrast. You and uh, Ann. And, and, and you're a genuine, authentic guy. It's definitely not anything about you know, negative press and throwing anything to the other side of sure. the aisle. But it's a competition here. Oh, yeah. And it's a... I'd like to say it's a stark contrast, but if you start at first principles and goals, they're not totally dissimilar. She would like to maintain the beauty of the county, or at least th that's the stated goal of her campaign and herself, um, and I would like that as well. It's the methods to achieve the goal, that goal in particular. There are some other things where we diverge radically, um, and that would be as far as economic freedom, and allowing businesses to grow and new businesses to come in. It seems like that is not a priority that she's had. Uh, I heard her on the radio with Joe Thomas. Shoots. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Well, the shoots the brewery. Shoots among, I mean, yeah. there's, that, that's just one. They of, ended up going to Roanoke. They didn't yeah. open in Roanoke, but still they would have been a welcome addition in Almoral County, 110 jobs created. One of 50, Yeah. you know, one of a whole bunch. Um, the 151 corridor. I mean, no. we, we could have had that in Almoral County, in fact. The initial uh, breweries that were out there wanted it to happen in Almaral County. Um, our board never could, could get on board with that. And uh, look at the tourism boom. I mean, 151 to its own brand. Um, and, you know, we, we missed out on that as a county, unfortunately. But Let's welcome Richard Fox to the program. Cut the sizzle reel uh, all the way through Steve Harvey's there. That's the first one. Um, Richard Fox, Roslyn Farm. Um, I, Twitter rock star. <laughs> uh, you man. used to be taking a, a, a little uh, Twitter break since I uh, ran for office. You are a passionate guy. You follow a lot of stuff very closely. Hello, Elliot. Welcome to the program. Um, Introduce yourself, your brand, the business to the public, and then we get into the nitty gritty. Uh, Richard Fox uh, with Roslyn Farm. I uh, operate Roslyn Farm with my fiance, Alexia Richards. Um, we are a, a working farm and a bed and breakfast uh, just right on the Urban Ring, right in the Charlottesville, Almoral uh, County line. We're near Almoral High School, right on Hydraulic Road. And um, so we offer everything from uh, farm to table events to lodging, um, anything that can incorporate our farm product. Uh, into whatever someone wants to do. We're more than happy to do that. Um, growing up on a farm, uh, being in agriculture my whole life, uh, with, with my dad being um, off and on the, uh, the president of the Farm Bureau and, and Southern States and things like that, um, you know, agriculture is something that's been so dear to me. And some of my finest memories when I was growing up was riding around with my grandfather and my dad in the tractors and, and checking cows. And we had that big blizzard in 1996. You know, those were the only things that could get up and down the roads. I mean, these are memories that I hold dear that, I quickly realized the older I, older I got, people don't hold those to you anymore just because people can't experience them. Um, whether it's uh, development, whether it is poor um, economic uh, programs pressed by county and local governments, but people just can't experience the farm lifestyle anymore. So it's been so um, enriching and, and exciting to be able to open that up uh, to the public, to be able to open our place up to the public, have people come down uh, from D.C., from uh, New York, and even just from across the street, just to experience something that they don't get to experience every day. Um, it, it's, it's great being able to, to teach about agriculture and uh, between the, the chickens and, and the ducks and the goats and the cows and the horses and, and the garden and everything else that we do, and uh, we're, we're just so excited. Um, about everything that we can offer and, and kind of bring to the, the region. I love that. Sizzle Reel That, Harris Tolber. Um, Josiah Leonard giving you some props on the show right now. Elliot Harding, Wayne Knight, Adam Velio mm -hmm. um, watching right now. Jessica Pastermack, owner of Killwinds. James Watson, Drew Craft, Daily Progress watching right now. Drew Craft, of course, uh, of course, of the No Good Beer Festival. All right, fellas, no rules now. Friendly <laughs> conversation. Three guys in a barbershop or bar spitballing about Central Virginia. Um, I'm going to throw this first. Um, Let me jump in there real yeah. quick. All right. So anywhere you want to go. When Richard said that uh, he was coming on the show mm -hmm. and he asked me if I wanted to come, I was thrilled because he's a perfect example of what you would want to bring into this county if you wanted a healthy, rural, beautiful, conserved environment. And the Board of Supervisors is doing almost everything they can to try and keep him from being successful. Um, I hope that Richard goes into some of those things that they've been doing along, you know, this, this 
really harrowing journey that he's had to, to maintain that farm in the beautiful shape that it's in. But a working farm right in the heart of, you know, almost in the, the heart of ring. the city, like just right yeah. there. And it was not going to be that way, right? So it was an old couple and they were trying to get out and uh, get out of, you know, the hard work that's required. And the options were obviously some millionaire can come in and buy it and let them pull, uh, you know, straw off it or hay off it for, you know, to keep it under land use or whatever. And eventually that old millionaire passes away and his kids who never visited get a letter in the mail, hey, this is now your piece of property and they're reading Old Moral County. I don't in fact, know. when we had cattle show up and we had animals show up, um, some of our neighbors who, I, I won't mention their names, but they are former um, Board of Supervisors, uh, actually sent us a letter, said, you know, why don't you just hay it? And look, hay is important, trust me. Uh, we roll up over 2,000 bales of hay with my dad every, every year for our cows and, and to sell. I, I understand the importance of hay. Uh, however, um, you know, these so-called environmentalists are telling us to only practice one type of farming that just contis consistently year after year drains nutrients from the soil. Whereas by introducing animals, by introducing rotational grazing, by diversifying some crops and things like that, um, you're actually able to not only get your yield that you want and, and get a, a product, an agricultural product, but you're also able to help sustain and, and build a soil quality. So it's, it's a win-win. Um, but I just, you, know, you kind of mentioned that, but I, I thought that that was ironic that, you know, here we are, the same guys pushing all this environmental stewardship stuff. I really don't know. It's, again, it's, it's just a virtue signal because they're riding some type of wave. They're not actually, it doesn't mean anything to them. Farmers are the true conservationists. So when we're going to get punished uh, because of the rain tax, we're going to get punished because you're taking um, a disproportionately valuing uh, land against homes and, and things like that and making it harder and harder for people to continue to farm or for families to continue to farm. Um, it's, it's frustrating. People take it personal. And I think that's why you saw uh, the, um, all the people come out last year with the rain tax battle, um, because this no longer was just another, uh, you know, dumb tax that, yeah, whatever, we're going to feel it in our pocketbook, but the county does it. No, I mean, this was something that was going to disproportionately affect farmers. It was going to affect small businesses. It was going to affect nonprofits, uh, much more so than um, people within, like, an, an urban area. And you're looking, those are the guys that are actually contributing to the runoff problem. So again, uh, we're kind of chasing our tail or we're, we're counting our chickens before the eggs hatch here in the county. And it's, it's frustrating, it's driving people away. It's, it's driving families who have been here for uh, generations away. Um, it's, uh, you know, some of the stuff we had to deal with at the county. I mean, it, anybody else probably would have given up after a while. And that's just not in our blood. I mean, we're fighters, so that's why we're gonna continue to fight for this. I mean, I'm, I'm from here, my family's been here since uh, the mid 1700s, early 1700s, it's, we're not going anywhere. Um, but, uh, the, you know, the county certainly makes it hard to just try to survive. I yeah. love that. Sizzle reel that from Steve Harvey's commentary to Richard Fox's finish right there. Jump in, Steve. Yeah. So you got three media outlets watching right now. This is, this is the lasting conservation that you can get. If you were to promote the success of people like Richard and his fiance, they're going to be living and working and maintaining that property in the beautiful shape that it's in for 50 plus years. If instead they had sold this property to a millionaire who's 80 years old, it's got 10 years of hay, and then who knows what happens next, right? And Richard's explaining exactly how they conserve the land, make sure it's healthy and it's not, there's no, you know, runoff poisons or anything like that, um, crop rotation, you know, healthy natural fertilizers coming from the animals that they bring onto the property, not spraying a bunch of pesticides and stuff like that and you get 50 years of conservation out of this. If you can position the government in a way that it is not inhibiting the growth and success of small young families starting out a farm like that, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying, uh, for instance, right now, uh, not to mention the, the, uh, the land use issue where they're devaluing the, the actual physical land and upvaluing the price of the house in order to get around land use protections. I'm because trying, if you ask Ann, yeah. that's the reason why. And Malik. If you ask Ann Malik, that's the reason why uh, we don't have the proper education funding. It isn't because of the revenue sharing agreement, which is actually the real reason behind it and the disproportionate uh, payout from the state. With the city that's of Charlottesville. With the city of Charlottesville, that's yeah. a different story uh, for a little later in the show. Uh, but Ann will tell you it's because we have a bunch of wealthy landowners in this county. Um, I, again, something that we kind of see from you know people on her team kind of going after um, individual success, going after wealth. I mean, these are people who help 
do. I mean, they, they keep this county beautiful. Um, and Ann wants to go after them and, and blame them for the reason why we can't, um, you know, have the proper education funding for our kids. Again, making it about education, making it about something that is going to pull at someone's heartstrings. Um, it's just, it's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. Yeah. Well, if you need funding for the schools, how about promoting business growth within yes. mm -hmm. natural business natural growth, tax revenue agribusiness? Will take care of it. There are breweries, distilleries, wineries, all popping up in Nelson County, in Greene County, in Fluvanna County. It, businesses are popping up all over the place because we have a gorgeous area with an amazing hospital and an amazing university. And I mean, the city of Charlottesville is a draw for a lot of people. Amen. All these businesses want to pop up here, want to get some advertising. Yeah. You, and, Amen. And, you know, grow other businesses, you know, build off of each other. We've got Injik up there that supplies all kinds of people that, you know, are interested in going to breweries and wineries and agribusiness. But they're not coming here to Albemarle. I mean, we can't even get our firefighters and our police officers to, to live to live here in the, in county. the county that they protect. We live in Waynesboro. Oh, the nurses. Yeah. The, I, right. I go the to teachers. the teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm a veteran, and I go to the Charlottesville Seabock, which is the uh, outpatient clinic for the VA in Charlottesville, and they're fantastic. They were actually ranked number one in the country for vet veteran satisfaction. Fantastic service. Those nurses and doctors can't afford to live in this county. They drive in from Waynesboro, like you're saying, my personal nurse drives Same with all city the way of Charlottesville. in. Yeah, drive all the way in across the mountain, everything else, to come work here. I met so many people when I ran for uh, House of Delegates for the 25th District. I mean, the bulk of that district is over in Augusta uh, and Rockingham. And so many people, when I was going on door knocking, uh, it, it was so interesting. I knocked on the door, talked to them. Uh, obviously, they're from there. They live there. Uh, but they all work over here. Um, or a big chunk of them worked over here. So it was just it was, it was a neat contrast to see. Um, but it, it's a problem that we need to fix. It's a problem that we, we can fix. Um, but With the problem, forward thinking. Yeah, the problem the right, right now is we're just we're not thinking – forward in the right way. We're not thinking progressively in, in the right way. So all we're doing is we're, we're hamstringing ourselves. We're tying ourselves up uh, instead of allowing the growth that needs to happen in the county. Like Steve said, if we can just get some businesses here. Right now, businesses are horrified. They're absolutely horrified to open up shop in Admiral County because of all the regulations they have to go through um, because of this uh, ridiculous virtue signaling. I mean, uh, yesterday we celebrated Thomas Jefferson's birthday. Today we can't. I mean, what, seriously, what is going on here in Charlottesville uh, and, and the surrounding county? It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I actually sat in on that meeting uh, where they decided that they no longer wanted to celebrate uh, Thomas Jefferson officially. Well, now, all the, all the employees for the county, they still get a floating holiday. Yeah, it's a flex day. What does that even mean? It's a flex day. The whole point was to emphasize the fact that Charlottesville, UVA, the hospital here, the county's brand and name and existence is completely reliant on this individual in the past. Well, and for everybody holding him to today's standards as an individual who lived in the 1700s, the 1800s, I would like to ask them, would they today, how they live, like to be held to the standards of Jefferson's time? So they probably wouldn't. It, it, it would be different, um, at least socially. I mean, my goodness. You know what? That right there should be the end of the third sizzle reel. All the way to that point. The show's on fire right now. Um, Jack Ferguson in Scottsville says, I love the show. Love the conversation where it's going right now. Crozet watching, Charlottesville watching, D.C. watching, Albemarle County, of course, watching right now. A lot of folks in Charlotte, North Carolina watching right now. Let me throw this to you. Um, an approachable um, layman's question. Okay. How difficult is it to run a working farm? Introduce mm -hmm. us to your day or your week, what you're going through. Uh, it's, it's a labor of love, so it doesn't feel like work. Um, however, uh, you don't see a ton of people getting up at my age saying, hey, I want to farm for the rest of my life. Uh, it, it's tough. Um, and I you're mean, gener fourth generation? Uh, fifth generation. Fifth generation. Uh, probably longer than that, but that's what that you we, know. could count back to. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and, and, you know, it, it is something that... There's so many moving targets. There's uh, between weather, um, between, I mean, frost last year could be two weeks earlier this year, two weeks later. Um, so all that you take into consideration with your garden, with your planting of various crops. Uh, Mother Nature last year was absolutely terrible. Uh, this year has been manageable. Uh, it was just so wet last year. You couldn't move cattle around. Um, you, you couldn't sell the things. Our garden washed out, I think, four times. Um, you know, we had trees fall in the house. There was so many things that you can't control, whereas... You know, when you're inside a building and you're at a desk all day, you're in control of about 90% or more of, of kind of your general circumstance. 
Uh, you're you're at the whim of Mother Nature. Uh, you don't have farmers. a thermostat out there? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> no. Um, I'm going to throw the same question to you. I'm going to relay an anecdote, um, a little commentary from our friend Elliot Harding. Rosalind Farm is an innovative business in itself, not just farm to table, but farm to reception, working to build a vertically integrated farm event space. Such a great model. Hope the county can embrace it because it promotes our local and national res natural resources in a developing economy. I completely agree. Very well said, Elliot. We had Al Schornberg, the owner of Keswick Vineyards, on this program. And that's how you know Elliot is a lawyer. Elliot? <laughs> Um, My lawyer, specifically. I, I, I did know that as well. I wasn't going to bring that up. Um, Al Schornberg uh, owns Keswick Vineyards. Um, he has been on this show three times, very straightforward, um, very to the point. He said, look, if we want more regulations and bureaucracy when it comes to our land in Albemarle County, aren't they just encouraging us to take our land, subdivide it, build McMansions? We saw that firsthand. We talked about this off air right around the corner from where I live. I live in Redfields. It's Wintergreen Farm, Southern Almaro County, 100 plus acres. I wanna say it's 110, but don't quote me on that. Uh, my wife and I drove through it last week. 92 mm -hmm. homes from 600,000 to 900,000. Wait, they didn't acres. put affordable housing they in there? They did not put affordable housing. 600 to 900K homes, McMansions, Stanley Martin. Um, that topic to you anywhere you wanna go. That is precisely what you will get when you increase regulations and taxes in the way they've been doing. You will not get agribusiness growth. You will have people selling out and trying to get away from it. Or you'll have people trying to purchase or uh, sell their conservation easement mm -hmm. to the county and have no longer have you know working land. You'll end up with land going um, fallow. And I, I suppose we'll get a lot more forests. But I think that one of the most beautiful aspects of this county is the rolling, working farms that you see as you drive around. And that is not going to be sustainable. Like I said, you should be trying to get young people into this industry so that you get 50 years of quality conservation and they won't be interested in subdividing it if that's where they get their livelihood and Agriculture from. is the number one uh, economic industry in the whole Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, it, it's number one, and you and we're bordered. I mean, uh, you look at Rockingham and Augusta counties; those are number one and two in the state. So, I mean, right here in Albemarle, I mean, we are surrounded by so much agriculture. Agriculture has been such an important part of our fabric uh, in the in the Commonwealth. I mean, before we were even you know a, a, a Commonwealth, or before we were even a country, and uh, and just to see it come under attack in Charlottesville of all places, to have to fight for land rights, and this isn't just about us. I mean, this is just in general um, to to have to fight for land rights uh, while you know, we're in the shadow of Jefferson is absolutely just, I mean, it's, it's asinine. I have to think about it. It's, 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 it's beyond it's, ironic. It's beyond ironic. Yeah. It, it really is. And, um, and, and so it's almost like we, we, we've come full circle here. But, again, the, the county, with, with all the stuff that we're talking about that, that needs fixing, that the county needs to do, we still have so many people want to come here. But the county keeps turning them away. And, and I mean, if we could capitalize so much on, uh, on revenue between uh, tourists, uh, when you're looking at some of the agribusiness stuff that Steve's talking about enabling and enhancing, um, I, I mean, just in weddings alone, that's 50 plus million dollars a year brought to this county. So let's grow that. Let's look at uh, more farm to table type uh, events, uh, more, um, you know, orchards popping up with their with their stands and, and, and selling cider and wineries and breweries and distilleries. Um, let's look at, a, you know, there's really only one big production dairy left in the county, but I mean, there's just... There's so many opportunities where we don't have to develop our land, but we can continue to develop our economy, and we continue to make the revenue off of it. So Love that. we're not having to go around uh, people's backs with their properties, or we're not having to add you know additional tax. You know, when, when Steve's up there, uh, you know, next year, and he can actually finally like change some of these things to get us headed in direction, and he'll be joined by Mike Callahan, who's running down in Scottsville. Yeah, I'm we sure got to give a shout out to Mike. Two because, two conservative yeah. uh, voices, and, and it's conservative not in the sense of Republican and Democrat, but conservative with our pocketbooks and with our tax dollars, and knowing uh, that as a citizen of Admiral County, I am comfortable with paying you my taxes because I'm comfortable with how it's going to be spent. It's not that no one wants to pay any taxes. It's just that right now we have a serious problem. We can't trust that our money's getting spent in our prop or in any way uh, that properly benefits us. Um, we got some direct messages coming in. Well, thanks some of the people that are watching. We have CBS 19 now watching in the house. Give it a like. Give it a share on any of the channels that you're watching. Robert, I'm going to butcher his last name. Is it Albrecht? 
This is giving you some props yes. right now. Robert says hello. Steve, you're getting some props on your page. Give it a like and share on any channel. Um, Kevin Johnson says job well done. Uh, direct message coming in is, is the, the question on limiting what you can do with your land. Um, specifically the amount of vents that you can have on your property. If you guys can discuss this, because this seems to be the backwards of what being an entrepreneur and owning land is all about. Why don't I start with you on that topic? It's a good topic. Yeah, they, uh, they, the county just put in some new regulations that's very specifically designed to cut into the profitability of smaller farms in the area. Um, I, I don't have all of the details right in front of me, but it's something like if it's between five acres. I mean, it's, here's part of the problem. It's convoluted and confusing right, to the clear. point where I imagine a whole bunch of farmers and landowners out there were like, well, wait a minute. Does this apply to me? Uh, five acres, but not less than 12. And if I do three events after 10 p.m., mm -hmm. it's confusing, it's abusive, and it's not really called for. There isn't like a whole bunch of people with signs standing outside Albemarle County building saying their weddings are too loud. There's, that's not happening. They're looking for new ways. I don't know why exactly. They're looking for new ways to just get their hands on regulating every single kind of economic activity. Well, a couple area. years ago when they wanted to regulate events being held at uh, wineries, breweries, and distilleries. Did that impact you? Um, it, it, that, that particular uh, thing didn't really impact us okay. other than um, just as far as looking at grapes and planting and things like that, you know, okay. an acreage requirement. Um, but, you know, I remember it came up, well, how many issues, because of the traffic was a big issue. Well, you know, how many accidents have you had? So they had the county police there, and I'm like, oh, Lord, here comes some ridiculous number. I think he said three in like seven years. And then uh, fast forward to uh, this past fall when we're talking Airbnb reform uh, with the county, and, and they're saying, well, you know, how many times have, you know, with noise instances or, or where they're just, things haven't gone along, how many actual reports and complaints? Oh. Four. It was like four and seven years. Again, we're, we're looking for problems and, and trying to fix problems that really aren't there. Problems that the free market take care of. Right. Um, you know, I can... Uh, what about the brush burning? That sounds exactly like the brush burning thing. So uh, they had the, the fire department, or fire chief, put together a whole report about the dangers of brush burning and what the county could do to regulate it. And they spent over an hour debating just how restrictive they should be on brush burning. I think I talked about this last time, but you I'm did. just going to hit you it did. one more time. Brush burning is good for the environment. Mm -hmm. Rather than bagging in plastic bags piles of leaf litter and grass clippings and then having a diesel truck come pick them up and insert them into a landfill to turn into methane and all kinds of other gases. Negatively, are, negatively impacting our roads at the same time. Or even yeah. worse, just leaving it there. I mean, look, look what happened in California last year with uh, the massive wildfires. I mean, they, there's wildfires every year. Uh, but the, the area they were in last year, part of the reason why it spread like crazy or spread like wildfire was because um, of all the undergrowth. I mean, it, there was no treated burns. Uh, nothing had been cleaned out. And the stuff just went up and engulfed in flames. So my opponent's recommendation or concept or idea that she had that she threw out during this insane debate was that there should be a 100 foot safety no 100 meter safety restriction area around the area that you're going to do the burn that would prohibit almost every <laughs> single property <laughs> in the county from from doing any brush and burning. that's the goal uh, they want to hide behind, oh, we're still allowed. Bureaucracy. We're just making Red tape. people safe. That, right. That's not the goal. The goal is to outlaw it. The goal is to prohibit it. Well, just it, like it, when Ann said she wanted to regulate and possibly outlaw farm-to-table meals uh, and dinners in this county, uh, the, the county of Jefferson. And, and, and I'm just, and Ann owns a meat business. So. <laughs> Let me throw this to you. So libertarian, um, taxes are aggressive. That's how I feel. Um, I think our, our ideologies certainly line up in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm anti-taxes. One of the taxes I'm in favor of is the tourism tax. Why I like the tourism tax is you have people from outside the area coming to our municipalities with an open pocketbook, eager and excited mm -hmm. to spend money. These are people that don't tax our roads. They come for a weekend, they leave. They don't need our school system. They don't, you know, traipse all over the downtown mall for a month, spreading trash everywhere that needs to be cleaned up. They come for a short period of time, they leave, and they give us their money. These are the, the perfect amount of people that we want to tax. Here's where I'm going to go with, I'm going to throw it to you. I brought this up with Al 
Schoenberg. I would think that the county and the city, we would want to embrace as many events as possible at these farms. And why we would want to embrace them is because these events are being taxed. Mm -hmm. And then that revenue gets dumped into the coffers to be allocated however we need. School systems mm -hmm. is a perfect example. Instead, we're putting bureaucracy and hurdles for you guys to clear by limiting the amount of events that you guys can have, um, which makes no sense to me. It seems ass backwards to me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to throw that topic to you. You guys go anywhere you want to go. You want to start? Let me get a closing yeah. on the brush burning please, thing. Please, please. You mentioned safety there at the end. At the very end of the hour and a half, two hour debate about brush burning, they asked the fire chief, hey, how many, like, how much damage, how much stuff has happened in the last decade? No oh. damage. Yeah. yeah. Well, we know that. It's common sense. Three complaints in a decade. Mm -hmm. that, that's the kind of thing they're looking for. To, to regulate, but anyway. Yeah, we don't want to actually effectively address our affordable housing problem. We'll, we'll talk about it. We'll say we have one because that makes us feel good. I'm convinced. But we won't actually do anything mirrors. to do it. It's it just a tactic. Mirrors. It's a tactic to say, I think the affordable housing piece is a marketing and branding gimmick for, for the candidate or for the person that's in office to say, look, I'm approachable. I care about well, you. Give me your vote. But really, the reality is they don't care. And we're in such a convoluted mess anyway. Between the revenue sharing agreement, because of the city of Charlottesville, and then because of the growth, and Amaral County will only allow 5% of the county to be developed, well, where does that 5% fall? Pretty much right on the outside of Charlottesville and right up and down the main corridors. So it, it's, it's tough because you're looking at revenue from all sorts of different streams. You're looking at uh, so much infrastructure is shared between the two. Uh, so much isn't. Uh, kind of, if we did get out of the revenue sharing agreement, like where would the line be drawn? What? But at the end of the day, I mean, $16 million uh, and some of these big problems, and we're not talking about that. Instead, we're throwing up smoke screens about uh, wildfire problems that just aren't even real. Like, well, I mean, what are we doing here? And that, that's why it's important that we actually have common sense get on this board. I mean, for, and, and the last eight years especially, but, um, you know, it, it's been a very long time since we've had a, a bunch of just true common sense on that board. And I think it's people like, um, you know, Rodney Thomas and, and I think of uh, the, the Ken Boyds and, and the last time that we had some representation on that board and, and how, you know, they may have made votes that you didn't like, but they were thought out. They at least could trace back. Um, they weren't virtue signaling. Um, they understood that local government does best when it steps out of the way and enables its own individuals mm -hmm. and the free market to actually propel itself. Almoral County is Interesting, the two guys that you mentioned, entrepreneurs and business owners, mm -hmm. exactly. that have to go through the fix. So they're bringing a business mindset to the board. Well, when you talk to Norman Dill, that's why he has a completely different approach than just about anybody else on that board. Um, and him and I don't necessarily agree with a lot of uh, things, you know, nationally, socially, all of that stuff. I mean, he's on one end of the aisle, I'm on another. But when it comes to what's good for business in Almoral County, um, you know, him and I can at least see eye to eye because, again, he understands what it takes to run a business, to, to be successful so he can not just put money in his pocket, but be successful so you can pay the paychecks of everybody else on Friday, so everybody else can go home, so you can employ 10, 15, 20, 30 people. Um, it, again, the government hasn't made Almoral County this desirable place to come to. The people have. The history has. Um, it, it's certainly not the government. Well, Jerry, you mentioned uh, that you think that maybe affordable housing is... It's a gimmick. It, well, you say that, but it, it really isn't at this point. It was, it is a government-created problem. So in the areas where you'd like to see most of the population, or, or at least, uh, you know, most of the smaller houses and the townhomes and stuff like that, where you'd like to see those pop up, the county has a fee if you build over a certain number of units. Right. So specifically restricting the number of units. So the county claims, well, we have a problem with affordable housing. And then they put a fee on it if you try to build it. And then they increase the taxes out in the, you know, across the board, but the, the increased tax rate then causes you to have farm owners that then cut that land up into 92 new units of McMansions. Oak Hill because, Farm, because, previously Wintergreen Farm, Southern Almoral County. Because that's the only way that that's that going to make the profit, right. and the only way you're going to get houses, and they don't end up being affordable houses because the property is really expensive. So if you're going to build affordable ones, you have to pay like something like a fifteen thousand dollars fee per unit. Or at least allow the people to Airbnb it out so it can become affordable. But we want to again any any way to circumvent any way to go around it. Okay, well we're, the county's not going to approve a lot of affordable housing. Our, City our Hall, Airbnbs, welcome to the program. Um, you know, too strict, or, or we you know. We don't want it here because neighbors complain. Okay, but they want all these mansions. Great. So people my age, people Steve's age, your age, the only way we can afford to do those is if we do something innovative. But again, they want to crush innovation on the other end, on the back end too. 
So, so that's where we just keep running around in circles. Um, and that's why, again, it's just so important to have a different perspective. We should talk um, about ADUs. Mm -hmm. um, auxiliary dwelling units. Jessica Pasternak, welcome to the show. She says, love the show and topic. She's the owner of Killwinds on the downtown wall. Al Schornberg, who I admire tremendously, is watching mm -hmm. now of Keswick Vineyards. Welcome, Al. Um, ADUs. Um, where, open ended question. Your thoughts on this topic. I know where you stand. <laughs> Your thoughts on ADUs in general. Tell me what it is. It's, a, it's like basically a basement apartment or a cottage in the backyard, something that could be leveraged by the homeowner to rent in an Airbnb setting mm -hmm. or a 12 month setting okay. uh, to help offset the cost of home ownership. Is that a good description? Yes, that's, that's pretty close. Yeah. Again, where's Rory when we need Somebody Yeah, where's Rory <laughs> Solzenberg right here? He'll be watching here. There's a controversy about this. Yeah. I don't understand. Well, right? I'll, I mean, a lot of yeah. folks are trying to limit ADUs because their 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 trepidation is it does First not First of all, why did they give it a name? Um, well, I'll some subletting your basement. Well, it's could have just this is it's more different of, than a basement. Uh, it's like a different it's, it's a separate so you've got your house, this may be a unique uh, address. Yeah, or a garage apartment that's right, kind of a separate. cottage. A uh, small cottage or carriage house in the county. Uh, some developments okay. uh, back in the 90s approved carriage houses, even though they're nothing like the carriage okay, houses. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But that's, what, that's right. Yeah. That's so right. when we built our house, they told us we couldn't do that. And right. I didn't mm -hmm. even think about it mm -hmm. twice. I, it was just on a long list of things yeah. that I can't do on my property. And I went, oh, well, I guess my parents can't retire. And nothing here. there like you were not for me. It wasn't, yeah. or grand, I still use the word grandfathered, but. Apparently not I have I have huge issue with anybody, especially local municipalities, telling me what I can do with my land. And if I have, you know, I'm put into perspective here. My home in Redfields, I just straight up say the numbers here. You're talking about a mortgage mm -hmm. right around 2K. You're talking about with everything mm -hmm. all said and done, flirting with three, okay, a month. I mean, and, and we're doing well, okay. But for have, if it ever got to the point where we needed some supplemental income, why in God's name would mm -hmm. I not try to rent out the basement? Yep. Why would I not try to find a tenant to offset it? And you know, that is not something I can do. Well, well and, and the biggest concern with neighbors complaining to the county has been and, and an issue such as this, well, we don't know who's coming in. And, and again, they And issue, preserving the integrity of the neighborhood. But, but the reality is, okay, or you could move somewhere else and rent it out, and you're not even there, so you don't even know what that tenant's doing unless you're checking in on them. I mean, the reality of the situation is, if you're living there and you're also renting to somebody doing Airbnb, uh, the property itself is going to remain in better shape because you'll be more successful and you will be able to charge more rent, uh, which only benefits the surrounding neighborhood. Um, yeah, if people are bringing six additional cars, that's going to be a problem. One additional car is not going to be a problem because when you bought the house, uh, it was just one or two of you guys. Now there's three. Who's to say there won't be four or five in there by the time it's Thank you know, you. sitting over? It's just whether it's your family sense. or someone else. Like Again, this is common sense. Right. This is something that we're, we're uh, sorely lacking um, on, on city council it's and so uh, on the board of supervisors. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Jump in here, Steve. Your thoughts well, on this. It, it sounds to me like they saw this ADU thing. And they were like, well, wait a minute, if everybody's allowing people to live inexpensively, then we won't have a reason to have an affordable housing Well, I think the trepidation, program. and Richard, you can speak to this, I think the trepidation <laughs> with the ADUs was potentially the revenue that was lost from um, a short-term stay mm -hmm. standpoint with Airbnbs. Mm -hmm. And at, and you, you have perspective on this. Initially, when Airbnb started infiltrating the market, it was almost like a Wild West mm -hmm. because the Commissioner of Revenues, they had no way of tracking or, or mm -hmm. making sure that the revenue went to the municipalities. Now it's very controlled now, isn't it? I it mean, is. talk to us um, about that. And, you know, I think part of that is just a company getting its growing pains out uh, when we're talking um, what 10 or 12 years ago uh, had maybe – 50 apartments in San Francisco under its management belt, and now you're looking at millions of homes across the world. Um, so, you know, as that company grew and, and as it continues to grow, uh, you, you kind of work out some of the kinks. But I know, um, at least from the property owner standpoint, uh, using Airbnb is phenomenal. Uh, there are double verifications, so we, which you don't have that in a hotel. I mean, we know that if someone's coming, they've been, verif been verified by Airbnb twice. Um, most you can of them, check their track record on Airbnb. You can see Airbnb. where they stayed, right. get their reviews, um, all of that good stuff. So, I mean, you, you have a good idea of who you're welcoming, who you're opening up your home to, and whether or not you, you know, want to open up your home to them at 1030 at night when they said they're going to be, you know, driving down the road and need somewhere to stay. And, and it gives you the option, and, and it gives you choices. And, um, you know, one thing that um, – and, and I, I – didn't really have a huge problem with it. You know, when the county wanted uh, Airbnbs that make over a certain amount a year, I think it's $20,000, pay 
the tourist tax or the transient lodging fee. Um, and the way I look at it, look, if you're generating more than 20 grand a year, um, I, 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 I get it. I don't really like a threshold. I think either you should or you shouldn't because um, do I then pay you taxes or do I not have to pay taxes on my first 20 grand I generate? And I'll only pay you taxes on the 180, or do I have to pay you, you know, full because I generate over 200? It, there's and nobody in finance has been able to answer that question in two years. Um, or do you cut your business down a little bit so that you don't have to pay? So the that tax. you do less. And again, these aren't most people who get into this again as, as supplemental income. It's not um, a full full business. So making some of the regulations that they don't require you to have to move into your house to raise your family in that house. But then if you're going to bring uh, an adult in that house for one night, twice a year, they will make you go through all these hurdles. I get special smoke detectors, even though you may have a perfectly suitable one. I know we have, uh, I think it's 12 or 13 in our house. They all talk to each other. They're all connected. I get updates on my phone. It's ridiculous. But these are you know, little things that you have to do um, right now because the, the county requires them. Um, but getting our B&B license from the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, was a very straightforward process. Uh, we sent in our application fee. Um, the health department came out. They did an inspection. They do annual inspections, um, and they issue your uh, your license. That's it. Uh, the county has. I mean, it, it's been. It hasn't been a nightmare, but just the the extra work and hurdles you have to go through. And every month, um, you know, sending in uh, this transient lodging tax that now. Airbnb is actually working with localities to be able to pay directly out to. So for these last couple months, the argument from the county has always been, well, we need to know who has it so we can get the proper amount of money. And everybody in the audience says, well, Airbnb will pay out localities. They do it to Blacksburg. Y'all aren't allowing it to happen here. And, uh, oh, we don't know anything about that. Well, fast forward. Now, all of a sudden, Airbnb is pretty much trying to get to that with every locality. Yeah. And our localities around here don't want to take it because they said they can't trust Because of distrust. So they can't trust Airbnb. Right. They clearly don't trust the people. They don't trust the constituents, you and I. Um, so who exactly do they trust other than more intrusive government? And, and I, I don't think that they do. I want to just you got one a question more time. Coming in too. Well, okay, sure. Harp on this one more time. If you see a politician talking about affordable housing and that's not immediately followed up with, hey, let's pull some regulations out so that we can have some mm -hmm. more affordable housing. They're trying to set up another government program. It's a problem because of government programs, and they're trying to layer another one on top of it, and then what's going to come after that? Ten it's to $20,000 on your average uh, single-family stick-built home could be saved um, in this county. Those, those home prices could come down. I mean, that's the difference between someone qualifying for a $135,000 mortgage and a $150,000 mortgage or a $225,000 mortgage and a $250,000 mortgage, huge, which, which makes a difference. Things, yeah. That huge makes a difference. huge difference. Right. Every time they restrict things, like the whole conversation we've been having just now, they're creating more of a need for what they want to put in place is another government program. Mm -hmm. Mark Schindler, welcome to this program. Charlottesville Radio Group in the house now. Um, Emily has a question for you. Mr. Harvey, I live in the Whitehall District. I got two questions for you. How will your military service help you if you win a spot on the Board of Supervisors? Good question. Um, the second question she has is, what are you going to do to help the small businesses in the Whitehall District? You touched on that already. Two questions for you. Jessica Russo, welcome to the program. So my military service gave me a lot of opportunities to be a leader um, and to interact with people from all walks of life. Um, we don't really have a diversity problem in the military. Um, everybody's wearing green and we don't care about that sort of thing. This area seems not Whitehall so much, but Charlottesville and the immediate surrounding area seems to have an obsession with race relations, race issues. And my time in the military, I mean, my background was uh, completely non-racist before the military, but um, spending that much time around people from all walks of life gave me just a very diverse view of everything. I've lived all over the country. Before I was in the military, uh, my father was in the military, JAG Corps with the Army. And so across my entire life, I've spent time all over the, you know, all over the globe, really. Um, it gives me, a I think, a bit of a unique perspective. One percent of our population are veterans. Um, it gives me the drive and the will to serve for 
you know, um, inadequate compensation. I think uh, the hourly pay for board of supervisor is about two dollars an hour. Yeah, it, they just they gave. Do. Was it like a four hundred dollar raise? Did you see that? Yeah, four hundred dollar raise for board of supervisors. Well, and they and actually, I had a this conversation um, with Ned Galloway. We talked about this with Gerard Smith, who was running. Uh, he it, lost. Well, I'm not it's saying tough. that it should be more. Yeah. I'm just saying it's service. And right. It, you know, view it that well, way. Well, and with Ned yeah. Galloway, he was telling me one time, look, you know, it's really tough because right now, the majority of everybody else here. Um, either is retired or is able to put all this time and effort into They're it. They're either like, Here I am wealthy working. or retired. Exactly. Here I am yeah. working for Work a grinding. living. And, yeah. you know, it's you, trying to juggle all this stuff is tough. And they want to have another, you know, 1 p.m. meeting. And, uh, and, and you know, I'm looking like, again at him and people like him and Norman Dill. We don't have to necessarily be on the same side of the aisle to have a good understanding of what this county needs and, and what it takes to grow businesses. And I think that Steve is going to join that on the board where he's going to understand what it's going to take to help grow businesses in the Whitehall area that help preserve um, just that bucolic, I mean, everywhere from early to Crozet that, that we love. I mean, I, I grew up in that area. I, again, my family had been in the Whitehall district until I moved great here. district. Uh, fam my family is, somebody in my family has lived in that Whitehall district since the early 1700s. And it's just, I mean, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. And um, and there's so much potential there, but again, we just got government out of the way. Just spitballing You're here, but props here. Nancy Rodlin says Steve Harvey focused on helping taxpayers. Nancy says Richard Fox speaking from experience and knowledge as a local Airbnb business owner. If you have a question or comment, relay it to the fellows Nancy's in the chat the box. Here, yeah, I'm just spit, I, I'm just spitballing here. What if instead of the supervisors of Albemarle County spending multiple days a week for the entire year? Coming up with new ways to regulate and I tax think I know the where this is going, constituency. Like what if instead it was a concentrated time period, like they do in the House of Delegates yep. or in Richmond in general, like a three-week push? Then instead of farmers sitting there on the edge of their seat wondering if this Wednesday is going to be the time that they try and push the rain tax again, am I going to have to interrupt my week? They would know that there's only a two-week or you know two-month period where they're going to have to be paying really close attention to see that their board of supervisors. Well, and it would really also allow farmers to actually be a part of the process and actually run for office and have the time do that that was the great thing about well and all entrepreneurs and business owners exactly because it the opportunity cost is not is great well when i was looking at uh, well, and not looking at right when i was running for the house do it delegates, in the slow business season well that's too. the thing if it, it out i realized of course 400 years ago we decided to do this uh create it uh, by farmers and make it for farmers because here it is in january and february it's my slowest time when it comes to lodging when it comes to farming I, and that was the only way i could juggle uh, had I won, even being able to, to, to do that and, and to step aside because it was during our slow time. There's no reason we can't, you're telling me we can't run a state for effectively six weeks and then maybe meet two or three more times throughout the year for basically long weekend sessions. And we can't run Love a local this government topic. that way. This is sizzle reel. Last one, Harris. Steve, uh, start with spitballing through Richard's answer. Keep talking about this. This is a great sizzle reel right here. This is called common sense. Yeah, it would be very interesting. And, you know, we, we're worried you know, we've been having an entire conversation about regulation and ever-growing regulations and getting their hands into everything. Mm -hmm. If, you know, it's a very interesting concept of literally just giving them less time to regulate your mm -hmm. life and going, all right, now you guys can only meet a couple times, so it's got to be so only the really yeah. important <laughs> ones that you're going to be discussing here. That would, uh, you know... So it's just health and public safety right. and, you know... I love that idea. Yeah. I yeah. love that idea. And if something does pop up, obviously everybody lives in the county. You can show up and do an emergency meeting. That could just be a, you know, maybe instead of meeting every week, you could just be meeting, you know, once every two months just to make sure. Leverage that, technology. You know, yeah. Where the meetings can happen online and, and transparency is bred through online meetings because well, people it, then can watch it online as opposed to having to drive to the meeting. Well, that's why I never could understand when people used to get on and... Uh, don't talk too much about stuff all the time. I mean, you talk about uh, like when Congressman Garrett would do his town halls or Congressman Riggleman, and these people are just eviscerating him for saying, doing, oh, why don't you show up in person? Well, yes, that is important. However, um, I can reach I, a lot more people. I can reach 150 people in one room right. while five people are yelling. So, really, 140 people aren't hearing anything. Or I can actually answer your questions. You can type it. Everybody sees these comments. They're live, they're fresh, and you can actually reach. You're 20, 30, 40, 100,000 people? You're Why talking $30,000 of equipment here. 
Yep. 30, and the, the county can afford that. The yep. city can do that. One-time fee, 30K in equipment here. And then you do the Board of Supervisors meetings in a live mm -hmm. setting like that this. That would be a serious problem, though. Why? Because it's too much transparency? Because we do not have Mid good internet sense. access oh, okay. in the rural areas of this, the, one of the wealthiest counties in because the state. Because we don't want to put a tower up behind a school? And we do not have rural broadband. So <laughs> That so, would have been fixed. That so, would have been fixed in the Whitehall District. But again... Albemarle is much wealthier than Pluvanna County. Pluvanna County... Second or third most affluent county in the yeah, Commonwealth. Yeah, ex in, ex exceedingly wealthy. And there are still broad swaths of Whitehall District that have no broadband That's access. ridiculous. So the plan, I like it, and we'll do it after uh, I'm Board of Supervisors for a couple years and we get some broadband access out there. Broadband access is pivotal. It's crucial for the economic success. It's crucial it's for crucial children. Education. Learning. Education. It's everything. Yeah. yeah, but you know how right. that gets the there? Generation. Free with, MIT education. Without hiking taxes, without the government getting involved and actually running this, as you allow businesses to grow, you look at areas like Crossroads, you look at areas like Plank Road, I'm not saying you need mega strip malls or anything like that, but if you can just enable a few businesses to come, what are they going to do? They're going to pay for the infrastructure to get their internet there. Now all of a sudden that infrastructure is there and it's infinitely cheaper for every surrounding uh, person and within a five mile radius of that new development or that new structure to now have internet. Those kids now have internet. That whole corridor is useful. Um, uh, again, we just have to get out of the way and allow smart business growth. I mean, the, the county, and I think it was even Ann said, I mean, this is going back uh, six or seven years. Uh, you know, we want to make an example. We're Admiral County. We need to set an example. That's fine and dandy if you're doing it for the right reasons. Lately, though, they've been doing it for all the wrong reasons. And we don't need to continue down that path. We need to be innovative. We need to think forward and move forward. And there's, way, again, ways to do that that can benefit both the private sector and the public sector without forcing me to pay for something that I'm not going to benefit from or that I don't necessarily like or that I don't think my government should be paying for. Um, you know, the county wants to talk about these public-private partnerships, and they're talking about uh, these new uh, zones off of 29 uh, north. Um, looking at some of these development areas and, and redoing Burke Mar and cutting it through shopping center up there. And, you know, the big thing is, well, this relies heavily on public-private partnership. Well, then you actually make them put their money where their mouth is and you get them in a meeting and say, okay, well, we have this land and these other three buildings in front of this land right here on this road that you want to now cut through the middle of here. What are we going to do? How can we develop what we want to develop? What can you guys do? Um, you know, they don't want to they don't want to talk. Oh, well, we're just planning. It's going to take another eight or 10 years. Eight or 10 more years is taking you already eight to 10 years to get to this point. So now 20 years down the road, you've got investors and, and your building that you're trying to build, the only reason you could get financing on is because you had it filled up with potential tenants now have all backed out because it's taken the county 15 years to, to, to continue to drag their feet and make their mind up. Um, you don't want to rush this stuff, but at the same time, you have to enable it and allow it to happen. You have to have trust in the people and let the free market. Again, if you build a, a crappy building, nobody's going to come. That person will have to sell it, and, have, and whoever buys it will have to do some updating to it. They'll have to upfit it and make it to where people actually want to enjoy being there. The free market fixes all of these problems. Love it, love it. Harris, that's the end for the last sizzle reel. That's the last one. That's the fourth one. Thank you, Harris. Um, Can I evangelize about rural broadband? I, I, I have one, one question. Okay. We have filled it. Almost an hour. You've crushed it here. Um, I want one final topic, and I want to go. Yes, we're going to have to come back. We got <laughs> one more. We got another question coming in. It's a good one. We'll see if we can do this in about four minutes, and then we'll give each of you guys a final word. Guys, we're not going to get to all the questions today. Welcome, Neil Williamson, Free Enterprise Forum. Thank you for watching here. Hey, Neil. Um, we're not going to get to all the questions. We will invite the gentleman back. They've made the show phenomenal today. Um, this is a good question on eminent domain. <laughs> and where you guys stand on eminent domain. I, I hate that it's in the final four minutes of the show because we can do an entire show on this. I think I ran a whole campaign for you, four and a half weeks. On you you did. You did. <laughs> um, Open-ended question, eminent domain, anywhere you want to go. And then we'll get Richard in the mix. It's a complicated issue to me. Um, if you want civilization, then it's necessary. Uh, it can be done right and it can be done wrong. And I think it's incumbent on your elected officials and... Um, holding them accountable for making sure it's done right. Um, a lot of people had problems with the pipeline coming through Nelson County, including your congressman if you live in the 5th District. Um, you could drive by and see his big no pipeline sign because they did it wrong there. Um, there were options available and they didn't take those options. Either it was expedient or it was the price or it was just a giant company doing what it wanted to do. Um, but I don't think that it's as pure and simple as, well, I don't like the government saying that something's going to be built here. 
because power lines, pipelines, roads, I mean, you don't have civilization without that stuff. Okay, Richard. Um, you know, I, eminent domain to me, and it's tough because I, uh, and maybe it's just my libertarian streak in me. I, I actually, when I was running, I was called an extreme libertarian. Um, and someone pointed it out to me and they said, is that a bad thing that you aggressively want the government out of the way? And I said, no, I, I, I don't think so. Um, but I, I just, you're going to have to really sell me on a crazy transportation need as to why we need to, to take this land. Or you're going to have to sell me on, um, even, I mean, it's one of my biggest concerns. I Trust me, I not to get national, and that's not where we want to go with this uh, question, I do believe that there is an issue and a crisis at the southern border. I think that most people will agree as how do you handle it. And to me, when I'm looking at uh, a wall that potentially could cut off, uh, in some areas, 20 acres of people's property, um, I have some I have some problems with that. I have that. serious problems with that. Um, and, and, and I respect the reasoning behind saying that that's the right you need to go, but I also I have some problems with that with the pipeline. Um, when you look at pipelines in general, um, you'll get flooded with comments with people disagreeing with me, but I'm going to say it because I firmly believe it and I've looked at the research. I do believe pipelines are the cleanest, most efficient uh, way to transport that type of, uh, of product. Um, yes, they do they have spills? Absolutely, it happens. But truckers flip over, uh, tankers sink. I mean, it, these things also happen. At the end of the day, um, the reason why, I mean, they're, they're super, super well-built. They're all made with American steel now, and they're, they're safe. And the cool thing about a pipeline, you can run three to four to five different types of, uh, of gas and energy through that through pipeline. Right. Um, and you just break it up by, by water and, and a solution. So, so the, the great thing about it is it's just as efficient. It's, it's getting the stuff off the roads and, and, and actually cuts down on your carbon footprint by moving it. Um, do I think that uh, a private business, any private business, should be granted an eminent domain right from the state? Just because they happen to be one of the biggest donors to every single state politician, absolutely not. That's a hell no, right? Um, that is a hell no. Right. Um, and you. I just, I, I, that's where my problem with the Dominion issue is. We've got a private I business agree. that's been granted this right. Uh, you know, I, I have a big enough problem with it when the government's trying to sell me on like a life or death situation or, or you know, a, a sovereignty thing. But uh, is, how dare you let one private business, again, um, people so are say there not, are there eminent domain situations that you would he's be basically saying it's a sticky situation because he's I, well, I'm just I'm, I'm not I, trying I, to I, put I, you honestly I, I'm not going to say no because I wouldn't rule that out yeah um, but there's not a situation that I foresee uh, currently uh, where eminent domain is necessary I think that there's other options so currently uh, but maybe currently. in the past there have maybe maybe in the past uh, maybe in the future it's hard to talk it it's just like hard to get these roads you know yeah. than you, just, you just can't take away land, land from somebody right. and not a, properly pay for it, um, B, and, and what you have to look at, we, we saw what happened with the bypass, and, and we could probably have a whole show just on the 250 bypass. Totally. Um, but do this again. where this VDOT bought land from individuals, and they paid you X, they're turning around, here, and I understand the market changes, and I understand how it works, I understand they're right to, but they're turning around years later, and they're not selling it back to you the same price that, that they bought it from you for. Um, land that was sold for eighty to a hundred thousand dollars, their initial offer back is one hundred eighty. Um, nice return. And and so the, again, the states making all the money, and they didn't have to pay tax. I mean, they they, they had this land effectively tax free for all these years, uh, while the previous landowners still had to maintain it because it's in the middle of their property. So they don't want to look at a swath while governments spend thirty years trying to figure out whether this road's coming through or not. And then they find this side that it's not, and so you've had to pay the bill. You know, the Commonwealth's not going to pay you back for maintaining it. Um, well and said. then they want more land or more money for the land they took from you in the first place? Absolutely not. We got 90 I just seconds. don't trust the government. I trust people. I don't trust the government. I'm the same. 90 seconds left, 30 seconds each person here. Seth, Stephen, giving you guys props. Invest in Almaro through Almaro itself. Incredibly attractive area that should have no trouble inviting Did business Seth with balance, debt development. Great topics, everyone. Great show. Seth. Everybody listen to Prosperity's Folly. Great band. Yeah? Is that Seth Steven? That is Seth's band. Okay. Yes. Seth, thank you for watching the show. He says, great show today. Um, 30 seconds, anywhere you want to go. Um, Same for you after this. I'm, I'm running to bring freedom and prosperity and economic success back into Albemarle County. Uh, more sensible and straightforward and lean and agile government the way it should be for a local government. 
So uh, check out my website, steveharveyvirginia.com. I'm on uh, Facebook, Steve Harvey for Whitehall. And uh, please vote November 5th. And uh, if you want to get involved, check out the website, steveharveyvirginia.com. I got a message I'm going to relay to you. It could impact where you want to go with your 30 seconds. It does not have to. John Craig, co-owner of Seville Hop on Tours. The pipelines are going straight to the ports to be put on tankers. That could potentially sink. The national force has already been cut. Um, great show, guys. Anywhere you want to go. John, thank you for that commentary on the show. Um, I'll start off saying I think we need to do it again so we can pick up with the uh, the pipeline comment and talk about the bypass, among other things. I would love to do this um, But, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, Albemarle, Charlottesville, I mean, this whole area, the Central Virginia area is so special. Um, you know, I, I've been all across this country, and one thing that always took me aback, I mean, you'd be in Wyoming and you just see these, I mean, effectively just dirt mounds. Um, with with just this like Russell grass growing on it, and then you, you get out west and it's these lush, big, beautiful um, trees. Uh, you know they're wider than my house, and then you see the desert, and, and you drive through and you go all across this country. And at the end of the day, there's no place more beautiful than right here in Albemarle County and Central Virginia and the Charlottesville area. And um, I, you know, I don't think it ever started off this way, but I know that um, with directions that my life has taken and. And, and things that businesses have, have just kind of sent us in, you know, I, f I think that it's my duty, just as I think that it's your duty and your duty to do everything we can to make this a better place for people, to make this a, to preserve its beauty, um, and, and just to restore some common sense and, and allow people to just live their life. And whatever I do, whether it is, um, you know, through our, our business and through our bed and breakfast or, or through our farming, um, or getting involved into politics a little bit, or just being there to support Steve and making sure that you know people are showing up and that that you know he's doing everything that he possibly can to help them. And I know that he will, and I know that Mike Callahan will do the same. Uh, it, it is just so important, and you hear this leading up to every election. It's always this is the most important election of our lifetime. Um, but but really, guys, we all live here for a reason. We all love this place for a reason. We need to think long and hard. Um, and make sure that we are putting people who are in charge of it. I mean, uh, again, at the end of the day, what I said earlier, it's the people that, that make people want to come to Albemarle. It's not the government. Yeah, but the government still makes the decision. So we have to make sure that whatever we do, that we are sending the right people uh, with the right mindset um, who will allow people to, to grow and to prosper and to blossom and to flourish um, in this county. And anything that I can do to help advance that message uh, and advocate for a better um, pro Albemarle, pro Charlottesville scene, then, then I'm all about it. I, I think that's what you are. I know that's what you it's are. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's just something that's very important. Well said. Well said. I'm going to close on this. And Harris Tolber, thank you for running the show here. He's our director. A, I'm excited to eat these fresh vegetables from Rosalind Farm. Thank you for the generous gift from Richard. Um, B, I want to use this platform to, to first introduce you to what's out in the marketplace so you can make a more informed decision. I encourage you to think when you're voting, to think, you know, when you're voting for someone, it's, it's, it's for someone that's gonna run you, your municipality running forward. There's a role for an activist in our community. A role for an activist is not necessarily in an elected office, however. Uh, I encourage you to vote for people that have business mindsets because the people that are on the Board of Supervisors or on City Council are running a business. It's called the City of Charlottesville. It's called Albemarle County. Think about folks and put your voting efforts behind people that understand the concepts of business and common sense, okay? And finally, we close with the golden rule. We ask everyone to embody the golden rule. We don't make it about religion. We just make it about treating others how you want to be treated yourself. It's the I Love Seville show on the I Love Seville network. These gentlemen crushed it. The show will be archived in totality on ilovesevil.com, and I certainly hope we will extend the invitation. We can do this roundtable again because it was absolute fire today. Enjoy your afternoon, guys. Great work. Great work. Uh, we'll get a photo. Awesome show. Quick pick. You had four outlets watching you today, Steve. Um, you want to get the jacket?